So very briefly to review some of the main points from last Thursday, just want to get the principles across of evolution by natural selection. If we're different from each other, and those differences can be passed on to our offspring, okay, so if there are heritable differences between individuals, and these differences influence our survival or reproduction, then the successful variants will inevitably become more common in the population. So from one generation to the next, if some traits are conferring reproductive or survival advantages, and those traits can be passed on to their offspring, those favorable types will become more and more common every generation. Okay, so that's evolution by natural selection. Now, we hammer this and hammer it because evolution really is the core principle of all modern biology. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And once you've got a good grasp of how evolution works and has worked in the past, then, ah, yes, the scales will fall from the eyes. All species share a common ancestry. Okay? Everything that we know about from the fossil record, from the DNA analysis that we can do, indicate common ancestry. We share ancestry with the apes, with the primates, other mammals, all the way back. Today, I want to focus on this common ancestry and how we conceptualize and try to bring order into our perceptions of the diversity of life. It is truly extraordinary how different things can look in nature, from mammals to snails to spiders to sea fish to creepy crawlies to whacking great sharks with saws on the ends of their faces. All of these things have arisen the same process of evolution by common uh, sorry, evolution by natural selection, and they all, when you look at them very carefully, show signs of common ancestry. Now, this is a rough rendering of how many species of organisms, and these are multicellular organisms, that have so far been described and classified, and there's over a million. A fair number of them are plants, flowering plants in particular, conifers or evergreens, ferns, a few mosses, etc. A lot of arthropods. Arthropods are insects, so mosquitoes are in this huge group, very diverse group of insects. So are weevils, and so are butterflies, and so are beetles, and beetles, and more beetles. Unbelievable amount of diversity in the beetles. <coughs> So, through this course, we're both going to look at the degree of diversity, and we're also going to try to ask why some groups are more diverse than others. Today, we first want to see how people organize the information we have on the diversity of life. So we're going to impose some sort of order, a classification system. Now, people do this... Uh, some people are just OCD, and they just, you know, they're anal compulsive, and they want to put everything in order, okay? And other people do this because they reckon, you know, it's really quite valuable to know why there's lots of different species or where there's greater diversity. And so by having a checklist of all the different species, people can say that some places on Earth are very rich in biodiversity and the diversity of life. People who think really deeply about the evolutionary process view each species as an outcome of a very long process. And so by looking at all the different species and their relationships to each other, they're hoping to reconstruct more accurately the evolutionary history of life. So biological classification 
is generally performed in the field called taxonomy, which is the science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms. This is also known as systematics, where people take literally the huge stamp collection of all the different species and study the diversity of organisms and therefore think about their evolutionary relationships. So those people are called systematists, and they study systematics. So taxonomy derives from the word taxon, which is just a, one of these ugly words we use that's a category of classification. <coughs> As we'll see, a taxon may be a very precise classification or a very general classification, but it's that unit of classification at whatever level is called a taxon. And the first person to do this, we've seen already, was dear old Carl Linnaeus, who was inspired by natural theology, who wanted to get down all the different species and to put them in some sort of order to study the nature so that the study of nature would reveal the divine order of God's creation. Okay, so he was trying to construct a natural classification that will reveal this order in the universe. And so he first wrote Systema Natura in about 1735. And he developed a system that we still use today. So nearly 300 years later, Linnaeus' original classification system is still in use. Very powerful way of organizing diversity that we see. So what we start is down here. And each dot in this little box is supposed to represent a single individual. And if they all have the same geographic location, as we'll see much later in the course, that's a population. And all these different populations comprise members of a species. So these are all sparrows or pine trees of a particular type. So that's all the different individuals of the species. Then you can put all of those species into a larger box with other similar species, and they're in the same genus. And then that genus with a bunch of other genus can be put into a higher level of classification called a family. And all of the different families that are have broad similarities would be in the same order, up to class, up to phylum, up to kingdom. So this system is one of the few things I really will ask you to memorize. Most things in here I want you to understand not necessarily being a little robot, but this is really useful to memorize this classification system from the broadest level of kingdom, down to phylum, down to class, down to order, down to family, genus, and then at the most specific, the species. And an easy way to learn this, to remember the sequence, is King Philip came over from Greece Saturday. So imagining that you're dining on your lawn, with Lady Fitzpatrick, and she suddenly drops the news that King Philip came over from Greece on Saturday, and you'd say, why wasn't I invited too? Okay, so just think King Philip came over from Greece Saturday, okay, and you'll remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, okay? It's about the only thing I'm going to ask you to memorize that's got a cute little thing like that. Okay, now within this, Linnaeus developed what's called the binomial nomenclature, which is kind of redundant in a lot of syllables. There, binomial means two names, and nomenclature is a system of names. So it's two named names. So every organism has one of Linnaeus's binomials, and that's the genus name and the species name. So if you are in Lady Fitzpatrick's garden, and you're admiring her French roses, you might say that she has a very fine bloom of Rosa Gallica, okay? You really show how <coughs> obnoxious you are. So Rosa Gallica is the Latin name. Rosa is the genus. Gallica is the species. And that's unique to the French rose, okay? And then if you see in Lady Fitzpatrick's garden this 
wonderful bird with a red head, or sorry, yellow head and a white patch on its wings, you'd say, oh, look, didn't draw like a fusca. Whereupon Lady Fitzpatrick would say, would you shut up? It's a Blackburnian warbler, okay? But the point is that each species in the scientific literature has got one of these fancy Latin names, Dendroica fusca, for Blackburnian warbler, and Rosa gallica. And that's all we need. And you can go to any museum in the world and you say, hey, I want to see your specimens of Dendroica fusca, whether you're in Asia, Europe, Latin America, whatever, and they'll open the door and they'll still be Blackburnian warblers, okay? Even though they might have different names, popular names in those different countries, they'd all say Dendroica fusca. Okay, so we have our, oh look, French rose, now moss rose. Well, that's okay. We can live with that. So there's Rosa gallica, okay, and that's its species. So its genus name is Rosa. That means it's in the genus Rosa. There are 500 different species of roses around the world, okay? Then, and genus Rosa is one of several genera. Unfortunately, the plural of genus is genera. In the family Rosaceae, there's Rosaceae, and there's 3,500 species in the family Rosaceae. And then there's a bunch of different families in the order Rosales, and there's 18,000 species in Rosales. These all belong in the class Eudocotyledon, whatever. And there's 235,000, really quarter million species of plants in the class Eudocotyledon. Okay? And that's a very large class, and there must be one or two others, in the phylum angiosperms. Quarter of a million, 250,000. And then they belong, those several phyla, in the kingdom plants. Okay? So Rosa gallica, we classify as to species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. King Philip came over from Greece Saturday, all the way up to all the plants. Okay? And then our dear old Blackburnian warbler, Dendroica fusca, is one of 28 species of Dendroica. Okay, the genus Dendroica has 28 different species, and there's 125 total species, so several different genera of birds that belong in the family Perulidae, and a whole bunch of different families of birds that belong in the order Passeriformes, so passerine birds, passeriform birds, and Thousands and thousands of birds all together that belong in the class Aves. And Aves means birds. Okay, so there's 8,600 known species of birds. Dendroica warbler is one of them, and it's in a particular genus, Dendroica, and the family Perulidae, passer forms, and it's a bird. And birds are one of several different kinds of chordates, things with backbones, and that phylum, we're chordates too. And then there's a gazillion, there's a million different kinds of animals as we'll see long into the future in this class. We'll do a whole zoology lecture in one day. And there's a million different species, OK? So here you have an animal, and you have a plant. They've both got this binomial Latin genus, Latin species. And then you can see how they classify it all the way up to this higher, very broad characteristic of plants, which are clearly very different from animals. And the animals can be subdivided into different phyla. <laughs> And then the birds can be subdivided, and the passiforms can be subdivided, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Now, that little montage there, all of those are the same species. Okay, and they're all pretty good to eat. They're all tomatoes. Okay, or if you're with Lady Fitz, whatever, you might say tomatoes. Okay. Now, before Linnaeus. Before Linnaeus came along with his simple little system of two Latin words to describe each species, if you were going to impress Lady Fitzgibbon with your Latin about what is a tomato, you'd have to say, why, that's a Solanum cala inerme herbatio folus pinatus incis racimus simplicibus. Doesn't seem very simplicitous to me, but that's its full Latin name before Linnaeus came along. Okay? Now, after that, oh, so what that means. We translate the Latin. See, it means a solanum, the smooth herbaceous stem and size pinnate leaves, and a simple inflorescence. Well, why do you just say so? Okay. So a solanum is a kind of plant. There's a lot of different kinds of solanums. But everything else then is a description of what kind of solanum it is. Now, after Linnaeus, duh, simple. 
Solana, genus name, Lycopersica, species name. For whatever, Lycopersica means wolf peach. God knows why, but there it is. I don't see any teeth or fur, but maybe wolves like to eat them. I don't know. But it's simple, okay? And if you wanted to say, ah, oh, yes, that's a proper Lycopersicum, people would say, oh, yes, that's a tomato. Okay, so here we've got this hierarchy. We got Linnaeus, 1735, this dude figured this out, okay? So we go from species up to kingdom, and we still use that today, okay? And we do recognize now, as was recognized a fairly long time ago, that there are only about six different kingdoms, okay? So we did Dendroica fusca, which is an animal, okay? And we did the, uh, the rose, Rosa gallica, which is a plant. Another kingdom is the fungus, which we'll talk about again much later in the course. And protists, which are little single cell organisms with a complex physiology. Again, we'll talk about it in much more detail later. And two major kinds of bacteria. Okay, now Linnaeus didn't have a microscope yet, so he didn't know about these. He figured that these were probably the, the kingdoms that you needed to know. But with microscopes, we see these, and they're very different from each other, too. Okay? And we can use Linnaean system to go all the way up to classify everything within this framework still. But we've had to make one change. So in the last nearly 300 years, there's only one change to Linnaeus's original classification system, and that is to add the domain. So it turns out that these six kingdoms actually indicate three domains. These two different kinds of bacteria are so different from each other, they've been separated for so many billions of years, that they are fundamentally different kinds of organisms. And the eukaryotes, these are the things with complex cells, and the reasons they're called eukaryotes will be the subject of a whole lecture in a month or two. These are all actually fairly closely allied to each other because their cell structure is so fundamentally similar. Each cell in an animal's body, each cell in a plant's body, in a fungus, mushroom, has the same basic structure as a single-cell protist. And so they're all called eukaryotes. Okay? So that's the only addition that's had to be made to what Linnaeus started in the 1730s, is to recognize an even higher level of affinity than he could possibly conceive without microscopes and without seeing the insides of cells. So it's a pretty good job. Now, in portraying the so-called tree of life, I'll sometimes show you this graph, this uh, figure, which indicates these different kingdoms of fungus, plants, animals, the protists, and these two different kinds of bacteria. And this is broadly how they derive from each other. So back in the very beginning of life, again, we're going to go through much greater detail, a lot of detail about the origins of life in these very first simplest living things. So we have a division between archaebacteria and eubacteria. Then cells, individual cells, become more complicated, but organisms still lived as single-celled and then multicellularity arose three times, once in the fungi, once in the plants, and once in the animals. And so this is recognized as the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungus kingdom, the protists, these single-celled organisms, and then these two basic types of bacteria. So those are the six kingdoms. And now when we have actual ability to detect genetic relationships between these very distantly connected species, we see three domains. That there are the animals, fungus, and plants, or three tiny little twigs on this big tree of life. Because life has been around for so long, and diversification has been so profound, 
that as different as we look from plants, that's pretty minor compared to how different this giardia, which is a stomach parasite, is from different kinds of bacteria. And these different kinds of bacteria are from each other. These are so profoundly different that they're grouped as three different domains. These bacteria, the archaea, again, don't worry too much about the names yet. I won't get into this detail of the names until later in the course, and then the eukaryotes. And the eukaryotes are defined because all their cells have nuclei in them. And again, I'll go into detail about that later, but that's what designates them as being different from the bacteria. So we have to give you one more thing, and I guess you can't be talking to Lady Snodgrass anymore about tea. It's now you're going to tell your father, Dad, King Philip came over from Greece Saturday, and that's the sequence. Okay, Dad, King Philip came over from Greece Saturday. Domain, kingdom, etc. Okay. Okay. So, why do we do all this? Why do we have all these classifications? Why do we want to know classes and kingdoms and everything else? First, let's think about how it's done. And traditionally, and especially back in the day when Linnaeus was working out all of these things, it's phonetic. And that's classifying things according to how physically similar they look to each other. Okay? Phonetic. So we're going to talk about genes. That's genetic. Okay? Phenotype is your physical characteristics. I can see your phenotypes, or much of your phenotypes. Okay? And those physical similarities then would be phonetic similarities. Okay? So we might end up with a classification that says, well, look at these two animals. They've got mm, kind of sort of similar faces and kind of sort of similar physical characteristics of some sort. And so we might say that there's such a thing as pandas, okay? Now, we also want to keep in mind that when Linnaeus developed his system in 1735, this is before Darwin, this is before Lamarck, okay? He was trying to understand the mind of God, okay? So he thought, when he came up with this system, that all the species were created simultaneously, okay, in the seven days of creation, as in the Old Testament, and that they never changed, okay? So by looking at physical similarities, all he was trying to do was to just put these classifications, understand what, what is it that God might have really liked more than something else, okay? Now, Linnaeus is a really cool guy. I mean, we still use his system. And there's a lot really to admire about Linnaeus, a lot. Um, his first edition in 1735 was 11 pages long, just a short little pamphlet. Okay? He worked on this constantly his whole life. By 1767, he published his 13th edition, and there were over 3,000 pages listing species and putting them in his classificatory system. Now, when he first wrote about this, he was basing things on physical similarities, and he grouped the whales in amongst the fishes. Okay? But he was very open-minded. Okay? So 32 years later, he said, no, 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 that's not right. Whales aren't fish. Whales are mammals. They actually breathe the air, not through the water. Okay. So Linnaeus was open-minded, but he still was trying to fit in some notion that life was all due to miraculous interposition, and that this would tell us something about the mind of God. Now, in the 1950s, this rather sarcastic looking man, uh, that's not a fake mustache, it's real. Okay, his name is JBS Haldane, and he was quite a celebrity in his day back in, over in England because uh, he knew a lot about evolution. He also was very witty. And so when he was asked, it was either on radio or television, what he thought 
the insights that taxonomy had revealed about the mind of the creator. Because Linnaeus, he's trying to order all these things to understand the mind of God. Haldane said, it revealed an inordinate fondness for beetles. Okay? God must have had a hell of a good time making one beetle after another because there's so many of them. Okay? So in the time when Haldane made that statement, beetles comprised about 50% of all multicellular species that were known at the time. Okay? And now we know it's about a third. Okay? So there is a huge number of beetles out there. Okay? So I'll talk a lot in a lecture on speciation in a, in a month or two about why it is that there are so many types of beetles. We're not going to do that today. Just hold the thought is that there's tons of different kinds of beetles, far more diverse than any other group of organisms, multicellular organisms. Okay, so that's phonetics. And that's classifying things under physical similarities. Now, with much more information than just how similar things look, we can try to put together a phylogenetic classification. But this specifically is looking at evolutionary history. Okay, we want to know where all these different species derive from. Because we're not accepting anymore that species are all created at once, all miraculously appeared on the same day, but each species is derived from a pre-existing species. Now, in doing this, there's a branch of taxonomy or systematics known as cladistics that identifies clades based on branching points. And clades are literally just branches on an evolutionary tree. And the other is evolutionary taxonomy, where not only do you want to say that these species diverge from each other, but how long ago, or how much of a divergence has there been since they shared a common ancestor? So, going back to Darwin, this is before the origin of species, just in his notebooks. Again, this is one of the most famous illustrations in all of science. This is a sketch from 1837. At the top, and then here's a quote from the origin of species down below where he says, our classifications will come to be, as far as they can be so made, genealogies. The same way that you might trace back your family tree, you could do this on species and trace back who their ancestors were as well. So a genealogy may look like this. So you have your ancestor at the root of this tree, so this could be your grandmother's uh, descendants. So you're going to be Joe. Hi, Joe. See, Joe, you have a sister. You have a couple of cousins. And so Joe and your sister have the same mother. Your mother and your uncle have the same ancestors. That's your grandmother. So that's Joe's grandmother. Okay. And then your uncle's children are your cousins. So we can show this genealogy just like you do when you look at you know, family trees in the royal houses of Europe, and you can see the ancestors and the descendants. Darwin drew this genealogy, which we now call a phylogeny. So when it's done on the basis of species, it's a phylogeny. So geny is like the, the family history, okay? And the phylo is the systematics. So this is the phylogeny or the genealogy of the Galapagos finches. So he imagined there was a fringillid ancestor. That's a kind of finch. That would be the genus fringillidae or whatever uh, family maybe. And so then there was an ancestor. We call them geospitza that are ground finches. There's these other finches over here. These all now might have different genus names here. C. pallidus versus G. magnoroscus versus cerithidae. But these all would have descended from the same fringillid ancestor. And the further back, then the more different they look from each other today. And the ones that have diverged from each other more recently look more similar 
just like your siblings look more similar to you than does your cousin. Okay. So he suggested that there were several major branches in the phylogeny of the Galapagos finches. There are those that are mostly eating insects. So these woodpecker-like ones and all of these here. And then there are these ground finches and cactus feeding ones had a separate ancestry through Geospitza. So these are Camarynchus, that's the sea, Camarynchus, tree finches, and Geospitza. So these two different genera, and all the species within this genus have a more recent common ancestor than they do to any of the species over in Camarynchus. Well, we now have all the data by sequencing the DNA of these species, and yep, he pretty much got it right. There was now almost certainly an ancestral spinch from South America that it's represented today by what would be called a blue-black grass quit. So that's an actual bird on the South American mainland that flew over to the islands and gave rise then to these seed eaters, the large ground finch, the medium ground finch. This is the one we looked at, Darwin's finch, last week small ground finch. These diversified fairly recently. Further back was the separation of the sharp-billed ground finch, and then the cactus finches. These all do indeed share a common ancestry. And then there's a second branch, Camarynchus. <coughs> Again, ultimately go back to the blueback grass quit, the same one as this group over here. And the warbler finch separated off from the rest of this group here first, and the vegetarian finch, and then a more recent diversification of these different kinds of tree finches and wood woodpecker finches. Okay? So this is a modern phylogeny based on all the modern methods, and it pretty much confirms the classification that Darwin made based on physical similarities. So this point of doing this is that these similarities can give us a sense of how recently they must have diversified from each other. And these are so different from this group that their diversification is very deep in the root of the family tree of the, of the Darwin's finches. Okay, so Darwin got it right with the finches. A lot of the things that Linnaeus did got it right. For example, he eventually figured out that whales were mammals, not fish. So physical similarities have been used for hundreds of years to try to guess common ancestry. And there are some traits that really serve that purpose very well. So our forearms, that's our upper arm, our forearm, our wrists, and our finger bones, we can see that same basic blueprint in cats, frogs, lizards, fossil uh, reptiles. So you see the two bones in the forearm, the one upper arm, the wrist, etc. These have been modified quite a lot in the fins of whales, but you can still see the upper arm, the forearm, the wrist bones, and then these finger digits, which have become more plentiful and extreme, and then modified in the back. But there's still two bones in the forearm, one in the upper arm of the bat and of the bird, okay? In the horse, these have really been modified. One of these has been lost in the forearm, just a few wrist bones, and then the toe bones are very simplified just to have down to one hook. But it's the same basic plan with modifications, okay? Now these kinds of traits that are similar to each other because they're all derived from this basic blueprint of an ancestor are called homologies. And this really is one of the most important concepts of the lecture today, is homology. That there's certain features, physical features, we find in common with other species because that blueprint has been retained with hardly any modification since being a rough lizard type reptile all the way to being human, okay, all the way to being a cat, okay? That's similarity by common descent. That's homology, homo, similar, okay? 
<coughs> so if we want to do a cladistic classification, we take a series of traits that we're pretty sure are similar in different species because of common ancestry. Okay? So we base our analysis on traits that should not have changed too much through time. And so their similarities are because of common ancestry. That's because they're homologous traits. It's homology. So let's say we have five different taxa. In this case, these taxa, a taxon is just a classificatory unit. In this case, it's going to be species. The plural of taxon is taxa. So we have five different taxa, and we want to put them into some sort of evolutionary tree. And we have five different traits that we reckon are shared by species because of common ancestry. That once they appear in a lineage, they're retained by descendant species. Then we have the ability to construct an evolutionary tree from these five characters, okay? So we have five different taxa, or five different species, A, B, C, D, and E. And we have five different characters that are going to help us to organize our classification. We see first that four out of the five species all share this red trait. So this is trait number one, character number one. Okay, so we'd imagine that there is a split, so that A split off from B through D near the root of this tree. Okay, and let's say that this trait of interest is four out of these five species have big eye sockets. Okay. They all have large eye sockets. We figure that trait evolved once, and it was retained despite further diversification within this lineage that now has large eye sockets. Okay. Next, we have a trait that's found in three of these species in the red lineage. Okay. So let's say they have opposable thumbs. Okay. So these three species all have this in common. When we say, okay, opposable thumbs evolved once. And once species had opposable thumbs, all the descendant species retained it. Okay, once you've got it, they all keep it. Okay, so then we have no tail. Okay, tails are lost. We've got these two species that don't have tails, D and E. And they also move around in a different way. Okay. So these two traits evolved once, and both the descendant species have these. Okay. Then we look at species number five, and it's got one more trait that none of the others have. We can yak away at each other. Okay. So we've got language, and that separates us from the other species. Okay. So in this particular example, once large eye sockets evolved, then all species kept large eye sockets that diversified within that lineage. Once they had opposable thumbs, all descendant species kept it. Once they lost their tail, started walking around a different way, they kept that trait. And then once we started talking, we'll never stop talking. <laughs> okay? So, when you're trying to construct an evolutionary tree, the ideal, wonderful outcome of your efforts, if you are this sort of person, is to develop a monophyletic classification. classification. Monophyletic means it's just happened once. Okay. So here we have four species in a tree, and something happened that enabled this group to branch off from this other group, and we see that they have a single common ancestor. So monophyletic means they have a single common ancestor. Okay, so all descendants of a single ancestor. If our classification is good, it'll be monophyletic. We've identified all the species that are descended from that one ancestor. Okay, we've done a good job. Now, a lot of classifications that have been made 
based purely on physical characteristics turn out not to be so great. Okay? Sometimes people use a term that implies common ancestry to these three species, but it leaves out the fourth. It's incomplete, so it's said to be paraphyletic. The classification is incomplete because the term we use does not include all the descendants of this common ancestor up here. Okay? Another way we can make a mistake is to think of A and C as being very similar to each other and belonging in the same classificatory unit. But in fact, that's not at all true. They each have other taxa to which they're more closely related. A is actually more closely related to B, and C is more closely related to D. Okay. So this classification includes multiple ancestors. These kinds of distinctions are very important to taxonomists, and they're trying to get rid of all the mistakes that have been made over the last 300 years by taxonomists who hope to see some sort of unit, and they were either incomplete in their unit, or it had multiple ancestors. Now let me give you examples to show you what I mean by these different types. First, though, I want to show you the ways that we can actually correct the mistakes of the past. And I've been mentioning how people look at the DNA. And next week, we're going to start doing DNA with a vengeance. So we'll see how the precise biochemical structure of our genes is coded, what goes along, what goes on along our chromosomes. But suffice it to say today is that each one of us have chromosomes comprised of long strands of DNA. The DNA is a double-stranded molecule. And the double strands can actually be coaxed into breaking apart if you heat them up. So here's the double-stranded DNA in a very simplified form for a fruit fly and a different kind of fruit fly and a third kind of fruit fly. And if you heat up the DNA in a test tube, the double-stranded DNA will actually separate. So you've got single-stranded DNA and another single-stranded DNA. Okay? And you can do this in separate beakers. You now have single-stranded DNA. What you could then do, if you really want to be, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, <laughs> is to either allow the double-stranded DNA to reunite, so we now have the red one back together again, or you could hybridize. Yeah. So you have one strand of DNA from one species and another strand of DNA from a different species. Okay? And you can do this from two different species that are fairly closely related. They only, they only diverged recently, so most of their DNA along their chromosomes is still pretty similar. Or you can do it with a species that's DNA has had more time to evolve to a separate kind of form. And if you do this, you can have what's called hybrid DNA. Okay? And then in a very, very, very simple way, and this, this was mostly done back in the 1960s and 70s, with childlike glee by these Frankensteinian scientists, you take this hybrid DNA, but you're not going to make it breed. You're not going to turn it into a monster. What you're going to do then is say, okay, I've hybridized it. I've got double-stranded DNA, but these are not perfect complements. And as we'll see again next week, the bonds between these partners are very strong if they're perfectly matched. And if it's from different species, they can't match because there's a lot of DNA that's changed along the strand. And the more distant and related, the fewer there are these matches across the strand. So when you heat it up again, you can separate it at a very low temperature. Okay? And if they're more closely related, they won't separate until a higher temperature. And if it's just the right match completely, you really have to heat it up a lot. So you can use the temperature at which these strands actually separate as a rough measure 
oh, these separated at 38 degrees, these separated at 58 degrees, these separated at boiling or whatever. The higher the temperature, the more closely related they are. So you could use that as a rough indication of how closely related these species are. Now, today, we're infinitely more precise in that it's possible to do the complete sequence. And again, I'll go through this in much detail. There's certain base pairs with the initials GATC. And in DNA, the precise sequence of those GATCs can be in any order whatsoever. And it's just Gattaca, 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 Gattaca all the way along. And you can compare the Gattaca, Gattaca, Gattaca of one species to that of the, another species. And each place where it's slightly different gives you an indication of how long ago those two species separated. Right. So with that kind of information now, we can go back to what people did back in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, around 18th and 19th century, and see whether they got it right with how similar species really are. Now primates, which includes us, the monkeys and the apes, turns out to be a very good monophyletic classification. Even a couple hundred years ago, people figured out, yep, primates are their own thing. If you use the word primates, that describes a monophyletic group. It goes all the way back to a single common ancestor. And so you have fossil primates here. You have all the modern ones. And they then belong in the same line. Okay, We are, by the way, then related to tree shrews and bats. Dracula's revenge. But the point is the word primate that includes monkeys and apes and other things is correct. It's a good, meaningful term. It doesn't leave out anybody, and it doesn't include anybody that doesn't belong in that classification. So now let's look at an evolutionary tree that's completely worked out. And this is for the primates. So this is all the known species of primates. And we're using the DNA now. And we, each one of these nodes and branch links here tells you how long ago, roughly, these things separated from each other. And so what we do is we have that long sequence of Gattaca, 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 Gattaca. And we go along each one looking for things that are the same or different. And we take an outgroup, which is, in this case, rabbits. Not very closely related to rabbits. Okay? And we look to see, compared to our differences with those rabbits down there at the bottom, how similar are we to all these others? Okay. And we find that, as predicted by the fossil guys, that tree shrews are somewhat related to primates. Okay. And then you've got these flying lemurs, bat-type things. Okay. They're fairly closely related. But then you get to the primates, and then all of the different living things, which are prosimians. And again, I'm going to show you a lot of details of these strange and wonderful animals. In a couple of months, we'll actually look at the evolution of the primates, so don't worry too much about the details here. There's a lot of very nocturnal creatures. They're called prosimians that have always been viewed as sort of precursors to modern primates. From them, we also see the lemurs. These are monkey-like animals that live only in Madagascar. Then we have the New World monkeys. So these are things with the flexible tail that can hang from the tree that's only found in South America, Central America. Then we go over to Africa, and we have the Old World monkeys, Africa and Asia. So each one of these is a different species, and these little teeny Differences in the twig shows the degree of genetic differentiation. So they're all pretty closely related to each other compared to how far apart the old world monkeys are from the new world monkeys. And then here's this third great group, the apes. And so there's Homo, that's humans right there next to chimpanzees, gorillas, orangs, etc., etc. Okay? So what we have here is an indication of recency of divergence. 
So these old world monkeys have diversified fairly recently from each other, separated from the new world monkeys much longer ago, and from the apes somewhere in the middle. So after new world monkeys separated off from the old world, then the apes separated from the old world monkeys. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. So when you get down to the really, really tiny little minor differences, right? Really minor differences. You know, we're we're only three and a half percent difference from orangs. About two percent from gorillas. I don't know that guy's very happy to be one point three seven percent related. Or different from him. There's got to be a mistake, says the chimp. No, no. That's the best scientific evidence, says yes, unfortunately. Okay, so that's how we now classify, classify things, and that's how we organize our classifications with those little branches. Now, when we do this, what we find is that our assumptions about time being huge and that there has been enormous change okay over very long periods of time it all everything lines up when you take the fossils when you take the living creatures and you look at the geology everything lines up so for example the earth's surface has varied enormously over the last quarter of a billion years okay now we have all these separate continents but once upon a time, there was a single continent called Pangaea, okay, where Arabia was connected to Africa, and North America was connected to Africa, and South America was connected to Africa, and Australia was connected to Antarctica. It was all one amazing thing. Okay? Then we have a period of time from about 100 million years ago where there were still connections between South America, India, Africa, Antarctica and Australia before these split into separate continents, okay? which really became very clear by about 60 million years ago. Now there's a group of birds, the ratites, which are like big bird, you know? Uh, so birds with big long necks and big bums, okay? So you got ostriches in Africa. You got the Rhea in South America. You got the cassowary and emu of Australia. And you got the kiwis and the extinct thing called a moa from New Zealand. And it's possible to reconstruct their genetic relations to each other. And they're more closely related to each other than they are to any other bird species. So these are six related birds. They're all flightless. None of them have proper wings. And they originated in Gondwana before it split into separate continents. So separating into different continents allowed these species to diverge from each other and become very different, although obviously more similar to each other than any other bird. So the ratite is a good classification. They are monophyletic. They share a single common ancestor from about 100 million years ago. And that's a great classification. Now, there are a number of paraphyletic classifications. As I intimated last Thursday, that Darwin upset people to say that humans are closely related to the apes. It's very difficult for people like Linnaeus to want to really be comfortable saying that, well, humans and apes are the same thing. And so they had, for a long time, the taxonomists did, a group called the Pongidae, Pongo pygmaeus is a orang. The Pongidae were the orangs, the gorillas, the chimps, and then this other kind of ape called the bonobo, also from Africa, and left us off in our own little group, the hominy. <coughs> and that's just not right. We belong in the same group as the other apes. Okay? So if anybody ever tells you the Pongidae, you've got to say, well, where are we? We belong in that same classification. That term, Pongidae, is an erroneous classification. It's paraphyletic. Now, these mistakes can happen not just for because people are reluctant to put us in with the apes because of moral reasons or theological reasons. 
People can make mistakes because sometimes traits may look very similar, but they're not homologous traits. They're not because of common ancestry. So let's look at wings. Butterflies have wings. Birds have wings. So do bats. Okay? But these are not because of common ancestry. As I'll show you, insect wings evolve very differently from the wings of either birds or bats. Okay, and bats' ancestors are not the same ancestors as the birds' uh, ancestors. So these traits that look similar, but they're not because of common ancestry. These are called analogies. It's an analogous bird. It, it's an analogous wing. Okay, this is due to what's called convergent evolution. So analogy and convergent evolution is the, another hugely important concept for the day. Okay. We're going to come back to this over and over again in the course. If we look at birds and we look at bats, just because they both have wings doesn't mean they're close relatives. Okay? Convergent evolution is when you have independent evolution of physical traits because they're solving the same problem. Okay? A shark is very streamlined with these really cool fins. Okay? They for their entire evolutionary history, they've always been in the water. And they are fast swimmers. And that streamlining is very, very valuable for being a predatory fish. Penguins are birds. Okay, their ancestors flew around. They came back to the water and their wings became modified, more like fins, and their body shape, much more like a fish. Okay. But they're not fish, they're birds. Dolphins are mammals. As we're going to see, they have a totally different ancestral body shape. But once they got back in the water and they needed to move quickly, selection favored streamlining. So this is convergence to solve the problem of moving quickly through water. Okay. So because of this, particularly in the first few hundred years of biology, People weren't always right in assuming a trait was an analogy versus a homology. And so the classic case of this is in the classification of the birds with respect to the reptiles. By physical similarities, crocodiles and lizards look incredibly similar, right? Birds look really, really different. But in fact, once you look at the fossils, once you look at the DNA, it's very clear that birds are very closely related to crocodiles. And they're much more closely related to each other than either is to lizards, even though lizards and crocodile look so similar. So the term reptile for the lizards and crocodile in the, in the common usage of reptile is not a proper classification. Okay. I used the word reptile before. It's an easy word to use, especially if you've been on a bad date and the guy you went out with is a real reptile. And you're going to use it. But that's a, that's a common use. That's fine. You can do that. Call a creep a reptile. Nobody will be upset except maybe the creep. But when you're in a biology class, the word reptile is kind of a, a naughty word because it is incorrect. It doesn't include the birds. Birds are directly descended from dinosaurs. If we look at the evolutionary tree leading to the birds, we have our old friends, the Tyrannosaurus rex, oviraptors, a bunch of other things. Then we get some lineages that start showing feathers. And I'm going to talk a lot about the evolution of feathers later. We'll get to that in more detail. The important point of the day is that birds clearly belong with the dinosaurs. Okay? I showed you a fossil of Archaeopteryx uh, last week. It's got feathers, but it's got teeth, okay? Now, the earliest birds were even weirder compared to today because they had four feathered wings. They had feathers on their back legs, not just their forearms, okay? They had teeth. They were dinosaurs, but they had feathers. Modern birds derive from dinosaurs, okay? No doubt dinosaurs were reptiles, okay? Now, just to emphasize how closely birds are to crocodilian dinosaur type things. This is one of the most heartbreaking, seriously, one of the most heartbreaking fossils ever discovered. 
This is an adult Psittacosaurus, okay, that huddled over her or his, I can't tell, uh, babies. A volcano is erupting, there's all this hot ash falling down, and they all got cooked. But the parent stayed looking after its young, okay? This is a dinosaur looking after its babies, okay? So that behavior, as we can see, and we'll see later in the course, there's a lot of behavior that's very genetically influenced, okay? And paternal care, maternal care is very strong in the birds. Birds are really good, devoted parents, and so are the dinosaurs. And so that commonality is a homology. They retain that behavior since they were dinosaurs. Like birds, crocodiles build good nests. This is in modern crocodiles. They brood their eggs, protect their eggs, fuss over their eggs. If the eggs get dry, mother drizzles them with urine. When the hatchlings emerge, they cheep like chicks, which alerts the mother to uncover the nest and begin carrying the newborns to the water. The mother may stay with her bird for a couple of years, protecting them from predators and shepherding them through hard times. Ladies and gentlemen, these are devoted parents, okay? This is not a lizard. It's much more bird-like. That's what birds do, okay? So, if we look at a classification that includes different kinds of mammals, and the bats, and the birds here, and the crocodiles, okay, we would go back and we'd say, okay, the ancestral of all of these, they had scales, okay? And none of them had wings, okay? Somewhere after these two lineages split, this lineage developed hair. Instead of scales, we have hair, okay? And so all the mammals today have hairs, okay? And those are homologous. We have hair because it happened once in our mammalian ancestry, okay? Now, scales have been retained in the other lineage, okay? Birds have scales. You see them on their legs. Sometimes they have a few around their beaks. And crocodiles have scales, okay? So that's homology, okay? Hair is homology. Scales is homology. Now, so there's hairs by common descent. Now, wings, on the other hand, are analogous, okay? The ancestor of bats started hanging around in trees, and they eventually developed wings. The ancestor of birds started hanging around in trees, and they, too, developed wings, okay? So wings are analogous structures. That's convergent revolution. There's an advantage to move around through the air, and it happened twice. Okay, so who's your cousin? If you're a bird, your cousin is that gorgeous mother. Oh, she's so sweet. Okay, not that bad. Okay, the other mistake is polyphyletic classifications. Pandas, I've been showing pandas several times, and it's kind of a weird group, but people have said about pandas, and you can look at the old uh, genealogies or phylogenies in the mammals, and there would be a group for pandas. Red pandas and giant pandas. But as it turns out, if you do the DNA and you estimate how long ago they diverged, lesser panda or red panda and giant pandas are really, really different. It turns out that giant pandas are panda bears. Their closest relatives are spectacled bears, sun bears, brown bears. They are bears. Whereas a lesser panda actually is more closely related to a raccoon than it is to the other panda, the giant panda, okay? So if we heated up our DNA or we did another method of trying to look at how divergent the DNA is between these different species, it's clear that there's no such true phylogenetic grouping of pandas. There was never a panda lineage. It was people who gave this word to this animal and called it a panda, and it was people that gave this word to this animal and called it a panda, but that's a bear. And that's a kind of raccoon, okay? Okay, so pandas are polyphyletic. So when people do these classifications, and they base them on physical characteristics, they want to make very certain that the trait is a true homology. 
And so sometimes you see the term derived trait, and that means that we possess it because it's derived from what our ancestors had. Okay, so that's common ancestry. So classifications must be based on true homologies, which are shared derived traits. So if we look at these different organisms, a hagfish, a perch, a salamander, a lizard, a crocodile, a pigeon, a mouse, and a chimpanzee, and we wanted to say what their affinities are with each other, we would look for the things in here that are truly homologous. And so crocodiles and pigeons can be seen as allied with each other because they both have not just jaws and lungs and claws and nails, lizards have those in common too, but they both have four-chambered hearts. So there is a good derived trait that tells us, oh yeah, pigeons and crocodiles, right. Now the pigeon then has a new trait that the crocodiles don't have, so that separates the birds out from these other groups, but birds are more closely related to crocodiles than they would be to these other species. And it's that four-chambered heart trait that gives, a ga gives away the game when you actually rip them open and tear them apart and look at their bits on the inside. <laughs> and when you look at mammals, fur is an extraordinarily persistent trait. Once it evolved, ooh, it gave rise to all the modern mammals. That plus mammary glands. As we'll see, mammals, mammy, it's all to do with the production of milk. Okay, That evolved once, and the mammals all possess that trait to this day. Okay, So those are the key, key traits, fur and mammary glands, that distinguish the mammals from all the other vertebrate species. They each evolved just once and were then retained in all subsequent lineages. Okay, now another question that's kind of fun to look at here just briefly is how wrong you can be when you base things just on physical characteristics. For the longest time, uh, taxonomists thought that whales were related to the carnivores. And so they had a lot of good fossils. So here are the modern whales. There's a killer whale, and they're the, you know, they chomp and chew a lot of things. There's a lot of the whales that feed on different kinds of things. But it was felt that the whales, ultimately, if you went back far enough, would derive from some sort of carnivore, a cat or a dog type animal because a few of the modern species have got such sharp teeth, okay? But there are other people who always thought, no, 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 no. You know, you guys are, you know, you're warmongers. You really like blood and guts and gore. You know, look at a whale and look around in the animal kingdom. And it's just, it's a big blubbery animal, you know? And what's another big blubbery animal that likes to be in the water? The hippo, okay? And if it's related to a hippo, then in fact, Whales are more closely related to cows than they are to dogs and cats. So which is it? Well, for a long time, the geneticists figured it was whales or cows, whereas the paleontologists, the people who study the fossils, said, no, no, they're, they're basically carnivores. Okay? So the fossils implied some sort of carnivore ancestry because all they could find mostly were their teeth and jaws. But the DNA did suggest, yeah, no, there's a, it's hard for us to believe that this is actually a carnivore because, you know, genetically it looks a lot like a hippo. Well, finally, only in the last 10 years or so, somebody found a fossil in Pakistan where they not only had the head, but also the feet. And they had hooves. Ta-da! So it turns out this actual thing up here, you could draw it again, but it would have hooves like a cow, rather than claws, like a carnivore. So now the paleontologist, the fossil guy, say, okay, geneticists, you're a bunch of smart asses, and it hurts us to say this, but you were right all along, and whales are basically big pigs, hippos, or cows, or whatever, this whole thing over here. Okay, so for the day, I've tried to introduce to you how people have done it in the past, how people do it today, 
And it's all just description, really. The original classification techniques followed by zoologists, botanists, whatever, all they had available to them was physical similarity. And it literally was just putting things in different pigeonholes. Okay? And Linnaeus didn't think there was an evolutionary history, so it didn't matter to him. He just was trying to get similarity. But as we've seen, if you do things purely on the basis of physical appearance, you can go wrong. Because very different organisms can have very similar traits, like wings, okay, and not be closely related. So when we're trying to construct evolutionary history, we're trying to put together a phylogeny, a history of relationships between these different species. What people try to do is to identify a whole clade based on, here's a new trait came along, like a four-chambered heart. So that identifies a whole clade a whole new branch of the evolutionary tree, okay? And with our DNA and looking at the fossils much more carefully, people try then to estimate how long ago, when exactly did this diversification take place? When we look at things like the ratites, those big moa, big bird type things, wow, they separated when all the continents were actually still connected. That's 100 million years ago, okay? But other things have diversified much, much more recently. Okay? So it's possible to do this using these different techniques. And this is the groundwork that we're going to see for a lot, a lot, a lot of the course. Towards the end of the course, I'm going to go through the relationships of all the living things. And even before that, we're going to look at the process of speciation and also why things don't always evolve. And all this is really going to depend on our understanding of the genetics and the time scale over which these changes are taking place. So that's all still to come, and I'll see you on Thursday. And I will, this one time only, one time only, let you know there will be our first in-class quiz on Thursday.